Afghanistan has long been among the most difficult, disease-ridden, impoverished, and all-around worst places on the planet to live. When the Taliban seized control in August 2021, the world was concerned, and the church terrified, of what they might do. The Taliban, however, boldly appeared on international news media promising big changes, peace, prosperity, and a better life for all. Now, we're starting to see the results of their efforts. And surprisingly, it may be the best thing that happened to the Afghan church in centuries. Last month, World Watch List released their annual list of the most persecuted Christians. North Korea's 20-year reign of terror at the top is over. Afghanistan is the new number one. Yes, Afghanistan is finally number one in the world for something. The Taliban have brought the promised changes. So why did I title this video, The Taliban, the Next Great Christian Evangelists? To explain that, I'll need to take you to Iran. I promise the payoff is worth the wait. Welcome. My name is Thaddeus, and this is Reason Answers a channel devoted to exploring theology as it relates to evangelizing Muslims. The year is 1979. A year of civil unrest has ended with the fall of the Iranian Shah and his West-friendly government. On April 1st, the people approve a national referendum making the nation of Iran an Islamic Republic. Optimism is high, with most believing that the new Islamic regime will bring peace, prosperity, and happiness, and rid the nation of its hated Western values. Fast forward 40 years. The people have seen what an Islamic state looks like, and they don't like it one bit. They've faced oppression, censorship, economic hardship. The government is perhaps the most hated by its own people of any in the entire world. Alcohol and drug use have soared as Iranians attempt to cope with their unsatisfying lives. The people of Iran are now completely fed up with Islam, and a recent survey suggests that over half the country has left the faith of their fathers. Yet, from great despair comes great hope. When the world sees only darkness, God reaches in and places a light. And my, has that light grown. In 1979, there were maybe 100 Muslim background-believing Christians in all of Iran. Decades of jailing, exiling, and sometimes killing Christians has had a big effect. Today, there are more than a million ex-Muslim Christians, and Iran has been the fastest-growing church in the world for many years running. The Taliban understands jihad. They understand death and destruction in the name of Allah. But what they don't understand is practical governance. They've quickly chased away the evil Western influence. But what they didn't understand is the impact that would have on their people. The Afghan economy has collapsed overnight, and people quickly found the humanitarian safety net was gone. Longtime Afghan missionary John Weaver explains the role humanitarian aid played in local missions. Every day, Muslims are coming to Christ because the Lord is pursuing them. He shed his blood to redeem them. But some of the reasons why they're coming to Christ is when we as followers of Jesus respond in the opposite spirit, meaning we approach with love and humility and grace and building respectful, honoring relationships, also showing hospitality, also you know, serving the poor and helping in practical ways. That is very winsome. It's a powerful uh, witness. How can we pray today? How can we pray this weekend for especially our brothers and sisters, but all of the people of Afghanistan? That's a huge prayer request right now that God would open things back up from the border standpoint, from bank standpoint, just from economic standpoint, that we can provide even greater assistance to our brothers and sisters, especially those that will be called to stay in the country. 
and let's pray that God would use this for salvation. With the economy in shambles and no Western aid to help, Afghanistan is now facing the greatest humanitarian crisis the nation has seen in decades. Writing for the New York Times, Christina Goldbaum describes the dire conditions. One by one, women poured into the mud brick clinic, the frames of famished children peeking out beneath the folds of their pale gray, blue, and pink burkas. Many had walked for more than an hour across the drab stretch of southern Afghanistan, where parched earth meets a washed out sky, desperate for medicine to pump life back into their children's shrunken veins. For months, their once daily meals had grown sparse as harvest failed, wells ran dry, and credit for flour from shopkeepers ran out. Now, as the crisp air grew colder, reality was setting in. Their children might not survive the winter. She continues, Afghanistan is on the brink of a mass starvation that aid groups say threatens to kill a million children this winter a toll that would dwarf the total number of Afghan civilians estimated to have been killed as a direct result of war over the past 20 years. Soon, Weaver's prayer will be answered. Soon, Afghanistan will be forced to reopen its borders for Western aid. And with that, Western aid workers and their Christian values that drive them. Afghans will soon see what it means to be a Christian, to be able to say, Islam hates us, but we love you enough to risk our lives. Here, have something to eat. But the foreign aid isn't the real story. The real story is local. By some estimates, Afghanistan was the second fastest growing church in the world when the Taliban took over. And a big part of that is the aforementioned Iran. When we think of evangelism in the West, we tend to think of tent revivals, charismatic preachers, and big-name speakers. In Iran, evangelism is all about one-on-one -on -one contact through what's known as the Disciple Making Movement, or DMM, technique. From the first conversation a believer has with someone, they're already teaching the person how to follow Jesus, minister to the church body, and even how to evangelize others, all before that person is even a believer. If you look in the life of Christ, he started discipling people immediately. Just as the Lord discipled people from the first interaction in the DMM process, we disciple people from the first interaction around God. So from the first interaction, they learn how to thank God. They learn how to pray to God. They learn how to minister to each other. They learn how to read the word and know about the authority of the word. They get messages in their vertical relationship with God. They get horizontal messages in their relationship with people, and they learn to evangelize all before they come to Christ. The DMM model is remarkably resilient to persecution. With no central leader, no church buildings, and every believer personally responsible for the Great Commission, there's little for persecutors to attack. Sure, they can jail a believer, but two others just rise up in his place. The next disciples are already made before the state can act against the first. This wasn't always the case in Iran, however. You know, the form of church planting in Iran is a very interesting topic because we've been in Iran for many years and we've seen persecution. And what persecution did was destroy the church that weren't disciples and destroy the church that were about converts. The seismic shift that's happened in the Church of Iran is when all these church planters found out that converts run away from persecution, but disciples will die for the die for the Lord of persecution. Sharpened by the fire of persecution, Iranian believers are not afraid of the state. They are not afraid of the supreme leader, the president, or the military, and they certainly are not afraid of national borders. Disciples have taken the gospel east, ministering to Dari-speaking Afghans, and following the same DMM model. The gospel is always powerful, but it's especially powerful in the face of hopelessness. An Afghan missionary explains, In a place with so much death, despair, 
hopelessness, people is not looking for nice speeches or beautiful sermon, they are looking for experience the power of God. The Muslim here also say all the time God is kind, God is good, they repeat that many times. The experience, the touch of the Holy Spirit will make them to truly experience God goodness and kindness and then it become more than just words, become the reason to live. Because of the goodness of God in our hearts we can face tomorrow. As the old song says, God become real. That interview was done about two years ago, before the Taliban took over. The interview ends with the following prayer request. How can we pray for you? I'd heard in August from my Iranian brother about suffering well and now me and my local family want to learn to suffer well and you can pray for that. All the struggles, pain, losses, difficulties is real and it is hard. I still many times allowing that to become the center of my life and I lose the focus and I get depressed. To suffer well is to not allow the suffering take the center and go through the pain with praises to God. We don't belong here. This place is just a moment. Our troubles is just for a moment. 2 Corinthians 4.17 And I want to lean to suffer well. The Lord is blessing Afghanistan. Yes, blessing. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All the pieces are in place. The Taliban intends evil. They want to spread the demonic teachings of their deranged prophet. But their God is impotent. The true God will use their evil to open eyes to what Islam is really all about. Famine, suffering, and disillusionment will make hearts yearn for something better. And the faithful disciples will be ready to show people a better way. Yes, the living Lord Jesus will make the Taliban into his greatest evangelists, and Afghanistan will never be the same. Thanks for watching.